Uh, it's a great pleasure and uh, privilege to have a chance to talk to Alison Richard, the currently Vice Chancellor at the uh, University of Cambridge. Alison, I will start by asking people when and where they were born. I was born in Bromley, Kent, in 1948. March 1948. Oh, March the 1st, 1948, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and um, what about your parents and, if you like, your grandparents? Can you tell me anything significant about them? Well, I can't. Uh, my, my, I had only one grandfather alive when I was born, and uh, he died when I was two, so I remember nothing of my grandparents, in fact. A reason for that is that uh, my father was 65 years old when I was born, and uh, my mother was 25 years younger than he was, but even so, you know, she was uh, 40 when I mm. was born. So I grew up not knowing my, the date of my father's birth. It was always a family secret. I now understand that it was kept from me and from my brother and sister because he was born in 1886, and I think that they thought that we would found, find this as children to be somehow sort of weird yes. uh, to have such an old father. Um, of course, I now understand as a parent that all parents are by definition weird and they <laughs> just have our weirdness in different forms. Mm. And I sort of muse on the fact that they kept my father's age from me until we were quite, uh, quite grown up. But uh, he'd never married until he was 55. My father was born in Scotland, went off to South America in 1911 inspired by reading Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle. This I discovered from reading his papers after he died. I never knew this. And he wanted to see the Falkland Islands. And so he sailed off. And of course, the Panama Canal didn't exist. So he went round the Horn and up to Chile and spent 11 years in Chile uh, on horseback, uh, sending nitrate and then grain back to England and came back in 1922. And anyway, to cut a long story short, he was working in the Royal Observer Corps in Bromley in 1940, 1941. And my mother was a volunteer cooking meals for the people working at the Royal Observer Corps. And they fell in love and got married. And it being wartime, they just put a notice in the newspapers saying, come to the church and a reception afterwards. And as my mother said, thousands turned up because they wanted to see who had finally captured this, uh, this man, a 55-year-old bachelor. But uh, the result was I grew up with a father who was a wonderful storyteller, and as I now look back on it, an old man telling the stories of his life and what he did in South America, and he was a great storyteller, and also a man of a deep happiness who had lived, you know, who lived more than half his life never imagining himself married, let alone with children, let alone with grandchildren. And by the time he died, when he was 93 years old, he had all of that. <laughs> so, uh, so that's my father. Um, hmm. It sounds as if his interest in natural history and Darwin might have influenced you in. Well, except that I didn't know about it until oh, after he died. But, hmm. but what I do know, uh, and you as sort of an anthropologist would appreciate this, is that when, uh, when this 21-year-old... Uh, in 1970, announces to her parents that she is going off to Madagascar for 18 months, mm. um, and no, there is no email, and no, there are no telephones, there is no <laughs> communication except possibly letters. My parents didn't blench. Mm. They supported me, and my father thought this was just grand. <laughs> and I think that, mm. you know, what I was really benefiting from was, if you will, sort of a genetic... Uh, predisposition to wandering. And that I inherited <laughs> mm. from my father. Mm. Well, what actually did he do in South America? I mean, did he have a job or he was just... Oh, yes, indeed. He first worked for uh, Balfour Williams. He first, no, he first worked for the Nitrate Corporation mm. and was sending nitrate back to uh, the UK. And then he worked for Balfour Williams mm. or vice versa and was buying grain from farmers and sending it back to the UK. But being my father's daughter, I could, we could spend an hour and a half with me telling you tales of my father's <laughs> life in Chile at the turn of the century. Hmm. Um, suffice to say that when my elder brother was uh, a little boy going to school, my mother got a phone call from the headmaster of his school saying, your son is a pathological liar because he keeps saying that, insisting that his father is a cowboy. 
Uh, well, the next day, Angus was sent to school with a picture of my father on horseback with his six shooters wearing his Stetson. And uh, Angus's honour and the family honour were upheld. And <laughs> How sweet. Well, tell, tell me something more about your mother. What sort of person was she? Well, my mother was... Uh, uh, she died uh, long after... My father died in 1979. My, father, my mother died in 1998 at the age of 87. Um, she was an astonishing person uh, and a very strong person, a very intelligent person who, in, a, in another time, uh, would, have, I suspect, be a would have been in this in our day would be would be a very professional a, a, a person with a stellar career of some sort. Um, I think that if she were here, she she would be saying to me, "I can't stand it when people say that I didn't work because I worked all my life. I worked bringing you up, and I worked on volunteer activities, and I worked as an almoner, and I worked taking care of my mother, and I worked, you know, with your, you know." taking care of your father and as a wife and this nonsense that that's not work that wouldn't, you know, she was, I mean, my mother was a feisty person and she mm. did go to LSE and she mm. did an almoning degree and in fact loved working as a, what would now be called a medical social worker I mm. think, that was called an almoner in those days, but then her mother was uh, ill, this was uh, 1930 or so and uh, she was one daughter with three brothers and so she gave up work to take care of her mother, and then uh, and basically was you know and as 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 was the case in those days I think really uh, sort of the daughter who will not marry who will not leave home who will stay and take care of her mother and that's her job in life and so she did until her mother died in 1938 and uh, you know up to not married my father three years later. Mm. Was, was she, were either of them influential on things like your reading or your books or uh, any of your intellectual interests at school? She, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting today, uh, one views students whose parents didn't go to college as somehow as underprivileged, and I think very often that is true today. But it isn't axiomatically true. Neither of my parents went to university, and in fact, for those of us who grew up in that generation, that was more often true than not, because so few people did go to university. But there were books everywhere in the house. There was a great love of learning. There was a great appreciation of education. There was great support for us children being educated. I was the youngest of my siblings, and I think you know, always viewed as the brainy one. I suspect rather sort of obnoxiously brainy, actually. <laughs> uh, but I was supported in everything I did. And, uh, and I can remember still sort of saying to my mother, oh, you're just being nice because you're my mother. No, you're <laughs> just saying that because you're my mother. But now as a mother, I think one of the sort of things one can really do for one's children is to support them and mm. to give them the confidence to dare to do things and to dare mm. to dream and to dare to, to, to aspire. And I certainly, particularly my mother, I mean also my father, but particularly my mother, um, gave me the courage uh, to do things. Mm. Well, that's very important. Tell me about your first school. Uh, where was that? Was that in Bromley? That was in Bromley, mm. uh, a, a quite old school that has actually since closed, a, mm. a school, a private school for girls, day school, mm. called Canard Park, uh, where we, you know, this was a school where we used to get wrapped over the knuckles if mm. we didn't get our Latin declensions right. I mean, it was... Uh, this your, uh, at what age is, is this? This is your... I was four and a half. This oh. was from the time I was four and a half till I was 13. Oh, I see. And it was a, it was a very, uh, as I look back on it, sort of Victorian upbringing. I mean, I remember the headmistress of that school walking into the classroom, standing up in front of the class and looking at me and saying, you're a very unpleasant little girl, you know, <laughs> in front of everybody and kind of essentially crucifying me as I know back on it over a period of time. 
which I'm sure stayed with me for many years. And mm. I'm sure she was partly right. You know, <laughs> I'm sure it was quite obnoxious. But I don't think it was a very good way of dealing with it. But, uh, but it, was a, it was a forceful education, mm. that's for sure, in the three R's, you know, mm. the three R's plus Latin and so on. We were drilled, we were tested, we learned poetry uh, as one did in those days. Mm. I, I think I could still recite the entire Pied Piper of Hamlet, <laughs> if you'd want me to, or mm. how Horatio kept the bridge, mm. or you know, all of the prologues to Henry V. And I, and I haven't forgotten all of that, and when I'm in Madagascar doing field work and the, the animals are sound asleep and I'm really bored, I just sort of recite poetry to myself, <laughs> and I think it's a great gift, and I think it's a shame hmm. that uh, as far, and our, our children hmm. did not grow up being hmm drilled into mm. learning poetry that they then had to recite. I'm not saying there's great merit to it, but it's something mm. that I feel mm. I cherish. Mm. Were there any teachers in that period between, what, four and a half and thirteen, at that school who you remember as influencing Oh yes, I remember, I remember. I mean, they, these were all larger-than-life ladies mm. who impressed themselves upon me uh, positively and negatively. And in fact, one of the pleasures of coming back to the UK, having been uh, in the United States for 30 years, is I have actually reconnected with uh, some of the women with whom I was at that school. And uh, every year we have lunch uh, at the restaurant on King's Parade, actually. They come up once a year and we sit down together. And you remember why you like, you know, across all of these years, I remember why I like these girls. You know, they're, they're, still your, they're your contemporaries, you mean? Yes, they, yes. we were in yeah. the same form together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. And they were my friends at the mm. time. Mm. Yeah. yeah. How sweet. What, what about, were there any um, teachers who, whose names you remember or particularly influenced you? Uh, this, I'm searching for this because quite often there's a point in schooling when one person becomes, maybe later, or sometimes at kindergarten, where I've had South African people like... Um, Aaron Klug and other people like this who, you know, had a teacher that really inspired them in mathematics or whatever it was. Yes, I, th I think, I mean, I certainly, uh, as a general matter, hmm. have no question in my mind that I ended up doing what I did through a succession of teachers. Hmm. I mean, my, 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 my life path hmm. was set by not, but not by a single teacher, mm. though possibly when I got to Cambridge it was a single teacher that, mm. or two that actually pushed me in a particular, not didn't push me, but inspired mm. me to mm. travel in a particular direction. But at Canaird Park, uh, at KP, it was the head, it was the fearsome headmistress mm. with her navy blue tightly curled hair, I swear her <laughs> hair was navy blue, and her navy blue suit, and her dark stockings, and her silver pencil that she used to bang on the table, who, Frank, I mean, it, it was a, it was a, it was a, you know, a, a, a nine-year trauma, as mm. I look back on it, that she taught me Latin, and she obviously inspired me. I mean, at some level, mm. I really must have admired her or wanted to please her, mm. because she was somebody who desperately made you want to please her, because if you didn't please her, the consequences were pretty dire. Mm. Now, whether that is good teaching or pathological is another matter. Mm. My name was Miss Forth, Ms. and Forth. Uh, mm. Miss Forth is no longer uh, with us. Mm. But um, she was, a she was formidable, person. and it's been amusing uh, reconnecting with these friends from that day, mm. with us all sort of uh, remembering what it was like to. Mm. Uh, they all felt the same about Miss Forth. Yeah, I think not as much as I did, though. I think, but but then I was the one who was sort of singularly and uniquely unpleasant and disagreeable and bad, <laughs> and and morally inferior. No. <laughs> In her eyes, um, where did you go on after thirteen? Then, when I was thirteen, I applied and uh, was awarded a scholarship uh, to go to a. a, a girls boarding school called Queenswood which mm. my godmother had gone to um, and so I went there to do my O levels and A levels and uh, when I went uh, I skipped a year and uh, and it was very difficult because it was I think I was a, a not shall we say a, a sort of fairly sort of uh, slow developer mm. uh, 
and there I was being put into a class with girls, already a slow developer for my age, being put into a class with girls who were a year older than me. And I can remember the horror of, you know, wearing white ankle socks when everybody else is wearing stockings. <laughs> <laughs> the, the things that one remembers mm. about one's schooling. But actually, it was a fine school for Where me. was Queen's It's in, uh, Hart it's in um, Hatfield, Hertfordshire. Oh, yeah. And still going. Mm. And, uh, and, and doing well, mm. actually. Uh, and there I had a succession of fine teachers whose inspiration led me to continue with my Latin, you know, and in English and in French and to learn Russian. So it was all, you know, I did the whole spectrum of O-levels, but then my A-levels were driven really by the, the resonance that I felt with the, the teachers that I had. And I went on and did S-level Latin, cause, partly because it was easy, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and S-level English. Uh, but of course, but but had no idea what I wanted to do. Hmm. And there was no science at that point. There was science, yes, but hmm. I didn't. I didn't do A level science. I don't. I I wasn't moved by it. Maybe hmm. I didn't think I was good at it. But I remember more thinking that I wasn't moved by it. So I did no biology. A I mean, I did all of the hmm. O levels: mathematics and physics and chemistry and biology and so on. But not for A level. Hmm. Um, it all of this, I sort of talk about uh, and remember back to these days, I am reminded of a book that you may have read by Catherine Bateson, um, mm. Margaret mm. Mead and Gregory mm. Bateson's daughter, yes. uh, called Composing a Life. Mm. And the first, the first chapter of that, it, it's about six women, uh, six women of, of, of some fame mm. uh, and their lives. But, and, and, and it's, the, the book, the book is, 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 is interesting, I, 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 not, not without problems in my view, but the first chapter of this book was just a revelation to me because she uh, takes up this notion of, of composing a life and said that uh, we live with what is today increasingly a fiction, particularly for women, but for men too increasingly, that lives are somehow linear affairs, mm -hmm. you know, when you grow up and you uh, get a job and then you continue in that career and you marry a, a spouse and you continue with that spouse and life is lived in a linear way. But actually, the way that many women live their lives is more akin to the composition of a patchwork quilt. Mm. And there's a patch here and a patch there and uh, your task is to collect the patches and to sew them together and to make a quilt that will mm. keep you warm at night. And it's a, <laughs> sort of a wonderful metaphor. Mm. Mm. And I always think that uh, I must look like a person who has led a very linear life, mm. sort of destined to mm. sort of move through the academic ranks and up mm. and in some sort of, you know, sort of teleological mm. sort of uh, move to being a vice chancellor of the University of Cambridge. I don't feel that way at all about my life. It mm. seems to be a large series of contingencies built around a fundamental interest in more or less everything. <laughs> so so if, if you have broad interests, how do you decide will your teachers inspire you to do a particular thing? Mm. Mm. And, and thus it was. And so mm. uh, when I got to Cambridge and inspired by David Pilbeam, mm. who was then teaching uh, in uh, Arkanan, Hmm. Uh, decided to be a biological anthropologist. Then I asked myself, of course, over and over again, why I why I had never done calculus, you know, hmm. why I hadn't pursued, you know, statistics and biology uh, hmm. beyond O level because hmm. there wasn't a good match. But anyway, somehow you you, know, hmm. you learn as you go along. So. Well, we'll come to Cambridge in a moment. Um, just going back to school. Uh, did you have, apart from the formal education, were you particularly interested in anything else like music or games or hobbies or reading or...? Well, I played the bassoon in the school, <laughs> in the school orchestra uh, because they needed a bassoon player, not, mm. not for, because I had talent. Uh, <laughs> but I played it with, with great... I, I, it, I have, it, it has given me a lifelong love, actually, 
of, of the bassoon mm. and of bassoon music. Mm. It, is a, it is a vastly underestimated instrument, mm. but once you know what a bassoon sounds like, mm. th there are many, many uh, symphonic pieces that have mm. wonderful parts mm. for bassoons in them. Um, so I did that, and I also sang in the school choir. Queenswood was one of the schools that Ernest Reed, who was, I don't know who Ernest Reed was, but he was a very famous man as far as Greenswood was concerned. And I think that he was somebody who nurtured uh, choral work, choral activity in the schools, is all I can think. Mm -hmm. But we used to go and sing in the Royal Albert Hall uh, in these wonderful massed school concerts. And again, I didn't sing particularly well, but I had a very low voice, so they let me in because they didn't have many girls who could sing. I think it was fourth or some yeah. some some very low part. Yeah. But I, I, as a result, sang, oh, Benjamin Britten, you know, the, the St. Matthew Passion, you know, obviously the Messiah, all, all of the great choral works during my four years at Queenswood, we sang, and once again, in a way that I didn't appreciate at the time. I enjoyed it, I enjoyed it enormously. But I didn't understand what a gift for a lifetime that experience would be. Hmm. So I did that. Um, I was, I'm not a great uh, athlete or a sports person. I used to win quite a lot of races, but it was always the egg and spoon race. <laughs> a slow bicycle race, I was very, very good on those kinds of races, mm. but I and I played my, I played hockey, I think, at Queensford, but not well, not mm. well at mm. all. Has music continued to mean a lot to you? Um, I mean, you, having heard all this and performed in it, I mean, do you listen to a lot of music now? Uh, you, well, I mean, now as vice chancellor, I don't uh, do anything. <laughs> I, do, I don't do much of anything, but. Um, my my musical interest really so but the general answer is yes when mm. i have a life mm. that life mm. uh, involves still listening to music but in particular when i met uh, the man who then became my husband in mm. 1976 his father in particular had been very deeply involved in the development of the uh, uh, michigan opera theater and uh, opera was important in his life and by extension in my husband's life and so my husband and I became uh, great lovers of, of opera and and have remained so and I think now that uh, I listen when I am listening to music it is more likely to be opera than uh, than anything else at this point. Are there any particular composers who you like more than any others? Well, I have very conventional tastes, mm. and I think, and so, uh, you know, Mozart and uh, Verdi and Monteverdi. We just went mm. to Weinborn mm. to see uh, uh, El Coronazioni, mm. uh, and it was magnificent, I mm. thought. I mean, it got bad reviews, but I thought it was mm. great mm. and splendid. Now, we had very good friends, uh, our dearest friends, who say to us, if you want to hear good music, go to a concert. If you want to see a uh, very similar to you, go to the cinema. And if you want sort of people in the flesh, go to the theatre. Opera combines the worst of all of those <laughs> worlds. And, you know, why would you want to do it at all? Well, I would say quite the contrary. Yeah. It, it combines absolutely the best. Mm. And I was at the uh, Royal Opera House uh, uh, a few weeks ago uh, to see the uh, first night of the National Ballet of China mm. uh, dancing mm. Swan Lake, mm. and uh, and it was they it was absolutely wonderful. But I will confess to you that I kept waiting for them to start singing <laughs> <laughs> because it, you know there was that aspect mm. uh, to the performance mm. that I sort of was expecting them to sing, and somehow disappointed when they didn't. I know that's probably sort of mm. terribly kind of uh, barbaric thing to say, but it happens to be true. Lovely. Um, I don't know if you want to put your cup down or if you're... I'm still drinking oh, my good. tea. Oh, good. Do you need you. any more? Or you're... No, 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 I'm fine. Thank you. Um, well, let, let's move on. There's so much more to say about one's upbringing, but let's move on to Cambridge. You, you came to read archaeology and anthropology, did you? Yes, yes. How, was it, how did you choose that? Because uh, 
I, 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 I went round and round about what I should read, and it was one, it was English, maybe it was law, and then I went digging in Cornwall with a good friend of mine for, in the summer. We dug an Iron Age fort on some dig. I mean, how this all happened, I don't really know, but I found that really interesting, and then I read a bit about Ark and Amp and decided that I would, I didn't think I really wanted to be a lawyer and I didn't sort of think that somehow English felt quite right. So I just decided in the kind of, as I look back on a totally feckless way, <laughs> well I'll read Ark and Amp mm. and it sounds interesting. And so having decided to do that and applied and got in, uh, I then uh, uh, applied to go to Greece, Northwest Greece with Eric Higgs Oh, who yes. was digging uh, in Epirus in mm. a place called Yanina, and they were, he was digging Paleolithic claves. And so I spent the summer of what we would now call a gap year, except it was nine mm. months then. Mm. I spent that summer uh, in northwest Greece and decided that I would be an archaeologist, that sort of mm. out of mm. sort of the array of Arcanamp, that I'd be mm. an archaeologist. And then I got to Cambridge and mm. actually started in the course and met David Pilby, mm. who was at Cambridge then uh, mm. teaching physical anthropology, mm. as it was called. And David inspired me mm. with an absolute fascination in human evolution and the evolution of complex social system, why be social, all of those mm. questions, and with the uncertainty and sort of mm. dealing with the fact that it, we will never know uh, for sure. Uh, you just kind of work your way to perhaps uh, knowing a little better mm. and that it, it and there was a wonderful sense of excitement and discovery anyway that was that was what took me into physical anthropology in general so David had a very very important part in my life and then the other person who did was uh, actually two people Robert Hind and Alison Jolly mm. um, Alison Jolly came to teach at Cambridge uh, because Richard Jolly, her husband, was, I think, a visiting professor or visiting the economics faculty. Mm. And Alison came and taught primate social behavior in the autumn of 1968. And I had just come back from Panama, where, from actually the canal zone as it was, from um, a summer studying howler monkeys which I had decided to do because it got me out of a paper <laughs> in part two, mm. if you did a project. Oh, yes. And David Chivers, mm. still at Cambridge, yes. who was a graduate student then, he said, go to BCI. Mm. And being too young and proud to admit that I had no idea what he was talking about, mm. I said, what a good idea, thinking it was an island off the northwest coast of Scotland or something, mm. and subsequently discovered that he was suggesting that I spend the summer in Panama. Uh, <laughs> by which time it was too late to back out. So I mm. went off to Panama and spent the summer on this island, Barrow, Colorado Island, studying these monkeys. And I loathed it. It was awful. Really? It was awful. It Why? rained all the time. Mm. Yes. Uh, it was muddy. It, I couldn't see the animals. There were poisonous snakes all over the place. And it was loathsome. And I came back all ready to write it up for Robert mm. Harding, mm. who was supervising the write-up. And uh, Alison Jolly was teaching at Cambridge that autumn, and I, she said, what have you been doing, and what are you doing? And I told her what mm. I've just told you, and she said, oh, you should go to Madagascar, because there are no poisonous snakes, <laughs> and there is, there is beautiful, dry, spiny forest, mm. and really interesting questions about the animals. Mm. So again, I mean, and, so, and she put up these slides of uh, the southern spiny forests of Madagascar, and that was sort of, uh, as they say, a eureka moment. Mm. I was entranced by these improbable, beautiful forests mm. with these amazing animals mm. bounding through them. Mm. And, and this was sort of really before, uh, well, ZooQuest to Madagascar, mm. David Attenborough's mm. uh, ZooQuest to Madagascar, that, that was new at the time, but nobody was familiar with this strange other world mm. uh, that had evolved in Madagascar for 80 million years, uh, mm. independently of the mainland. Mm. So. Just returning to uh, to one or two of the people, um, Robert Hind, who I've interviewed, was a formidable figure. I mean, he's very gentle in his interview, but he admitted he'd made Jane Goodall burst into tears with his supervision and things. What was he like? 
Oh, in, terrifying. Uh, just pop, pop it on thank you. Absolutely terrifying. I was really, really... Uh, uh, I remember vividly the first time I met him, he asked me mm. sort of to tell him what I knew about territoriality and mm. birds. Well, I didn't know very much, but I thought the man, you know, was keen to, to, mm. to know, so I told him what I knew, and he said, oh, as I thought, you don't know very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of clunk. Uh, uh, anyway, when I, was, uh, when I was named as Vice-Chancellor, mm. When that was announced, uh, I got a letter from Robert Hind, yes. and I was thrilled, you know, because I've never, I've seen him occasionally over the years, and he said, um, you know, I remember you vividly as a student, and my heart beat faster, <laughs> and he said, for two reasons, his letter went on, the first is that uh, you were the only person I know who uh, went on a an owner driver maintenance course uh, with Land Rover in Solihull, <laughs> uh, and the second is that you're the only student that I know who left for Madagascar to do field work with a down to the ground black fur coat as part of her field attire. Well, I was crushed. I mean, I <laughs> thought this man had remembered me somehow for my mind, or, you know, but no, it was for my skill sets and my pose. Anyway, I've la I've teased him about mm. this since. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, mm. it's, it's wonderful to mm. see him still mm. going strong. Yeah. But I obviously didn't leave much of an <laughs> academic impression on him. Mm. But never mind. But he, but again, you know, when I think back to these teachers, whether it's Robert Hines, he terrified me, though, I, though he didn't mean to be in the way mm. that Miss Ford at my first school did. But uh, in very different ways and with different styles of doing it, these are people for good reasons and... Uh, ill, perhaps, who make you want to be really, you know, they somehow take up your ambition mm. level. Um, uh, that would be an observation of mine. I, you know, and mm. I, I think there is no, no harm in that. The, 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 uh, the paper that I wrote and subsequently mm. published uh, on my work on Barra Colorado Island, the work that I put into it was because I wanted it to be really good and I wanted it to be really good so that he would think it was really good mm. too. Now, you know, again, analysts and, and, and psychiatrists might have their own view mm. of what all of that is about. Mm. Uh, but uh, but I experienced it as something where you were striving for for something worthwhile mm. and of value. So well Physical anthropology's gain was social anthropology's loss. Um, I just wondered whether, I mean, the people who were lecturing you in social anthropology, presumably only in the first year, must have been people like Maya Fortes or Jack Goody or Edmund Leach. Uh, Edmund Leach was no, well, he mm. was either on leave or not, mm. not lecturing to mm. undergraduates. Maya Fortes mm. uh, taught me. Jack Goody didn't mm. teach me that year. Mm. It was Maya Fortes and. Tambaya? Mm -hmm. S.J. Tambaya, Stanley Tambaya. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Um. Uh, and yes, and so you know, you say, well, so, but they were lecturing. I don't. I mean, I don't. Rem you see, I, I mean, I don't remember mm. the supervisions mm. that I had in social anthropology, mm. and that may Indeed. that somehow tells you something. I mean, they just didn't stay with me. Yes. Whereas I, uh, David Pilbeam, I, 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 I mean the David Pilbeam two mm. supervisions I remember mm. vividly still. Mm. So let's. Um, well, I always slip in at some point um, uh, a question about religion, because often it's in late, you know, just around the time one comes to university that one begins to question one's religion if one had some upbringing in a religious. Um, framework. Um, so can I ask you about um, your religious background beliefs? Were your parents uh, practicing any kind of religion? Or? My parents, well I, 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 I think my mother probably, I, I suspect she, I know she grew up in the Church of England but mm. we always went to the Presbyterian Church, mm. now the Reformed Church, or mm. not, but anyway, the Presbyterian Church, the Scots Church mm. in Bromley every Sunday mm. um, and uh, it was it was what you did on a Sunday morning you mm. walked to church and then you sat through rather interminable mm. uh, lessons and so forth and then you went off to Sunday school 
and that was church. And then at uh, Queenswood, um, that was a Methodist school, and there was chapel every morning and chapel twice a day on Sunday, uh, a, a fairly brief chapel. Um, I can't say it meant a lot to me, and uh, once I'd left school, I didn't uh, go to uh, church, um, and, and we kind of that whole piece of my life dropped out. But when our son died, uh, when he was a baby, uh, it was a, a um, cop, cop death, as, the, mm. as, as, as it's called. Your first child. Mm? This was your first child. Yes. And no, no, it was our third child. Mm. Uh, it was to the minister of the church in our village that he comforted us in ways and the service of Gavin's uh, funeral service uh, was conducted by him. And his faith, the flickering of his faith hmm. uh, in the midst of that darkness was important in helping me to survive that. And so, and I, and I think as I, at the time I thought that uh, whether I believed or not, there was comfort from that at, a, at the darkest moment in my life. And that my willingness, you know, when somebody said, would you like us to call the minister? Uh, that my reaction was yes, because it was familiar. No, it was a familiar relationship with a church. And after that, we started taking our children, which our, our daughters were then, when Gavin died, uh, our elder daughter was uh, uh, seven, and our younger daughter was five. And my husband and I, at that point, made a decision to take them to church every Sunday. Really, you know, and it's sort of explicitly, because if anything so awful were ever to happen to them in their lives, we wanted to give them the possibility that what had made a difference to me would also, should it befall them, make a difference for them. And maybe it would, and maybe it wouldn't, who can tell? Mm. Um, but, you know, so that, I mean, so that, so, so we went to church for many years. Mm. I, I go to Great St. Mary's now on, on occasion, not, not, not that often, as in my role as Vice-Chancellor. Mm. Um, but there is another, I mean, the, the other aspect of this, of course, is um, the role of uh, religious studies, but also engaged scholarship uh, and outreach in the life of a university. Mm. And, uh, you know, there is an argument that uh, in a post-Enlightenment world, there, you know, what, there was no room in a university for engage in a rationalist world, engaged scholarship. Mm. The scholarship of and by believers, but I don't believe, I don't actually accept that for a moment. I don't think a university is by any uh, stretch of the imagination entirely based on sort of rational empirical endeavors. We know that's not mm. true, and if universities don't engage in a really serious way with matters of faith and spirituality one will leave it to the crystal gazers and the uh, zealots. And so uh, at Yale, the divinity school there, and the Department of Religious Studies were an important part of the landscape with which as provost uh, I worked to, to renew and support. And coming to Cambridge, it was an absolute delight because at Yale I was told that the Department of Religious Studies, which studied about religions, had to be a mile away from the Divinity School, where people engaged in scholarship from inside a, a, a sort of their beliefs. But that you have to keep those two a mile apart, literally a mile apart, for them to coexist happily. And I got to Cambridge and found that in the Divinity Faculty here, there is a mix of, if you will, secular and engaged scholars believing and maybe, not maybe unbelieving, but less believing, people who approach their scholarship from a different point of view. And they all seem to get on, you know, and, I, and so I'm told, I'm just, you know, I'm sure everybody, everybody has their argument. But there wasn't, it's very interesting that there isn't this uh, 
uh, sort of very clear schism that has developed uh, in the United States. There was a, um, a, 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 a newsletter that has gone out of print in the United States, but it was very interesting for a while. Um, and I remember the headline on one of their issues was called Taking God Out of Religion. And it was all about the breaking up of religious studies departments, the breaking apart of religious studies as a tradition in US academia from professional schools, training ordained ministers and so forth. And at Cambridge in the UK, it's configured very differently. Hmm. Um, and the boundaries are not drawn in that way. That's very interesting indeed. I mean, this is rather brutal, but if you had to classify yourself if, um, as a believer, as a, an agnostic, as an atheist, um, and there might be other choices, where would you classify yourself? Oh, I would classify myself as an agnostic. I mean, I don't think... I, one, in my view, you cannot know enough to know that there is nothing that you don't understand. And I think it is hubris to assert that there is nothing that is within our comprehension. Hmm. But I, I, you know, uh, it, to, to, to sign up to a, uh, a fully uh, elaborated uh, system, religious system of beliefs, is, is something that I can't reach. Hmm. I mean, I, at the moment, everyone is, or a lot of people are watching, were watching Dawkins on on uh, Darwin, and, and it's quite a, a good litmus test to ask whether you feel that uh, Richard Dawkins, who you must know, has view that science and religion are not compatible and that science has disproved religion. What are your views on that? I don't think that, I think that there are the... the, the the, there are a, a multitude of very distinguished believing scientists, and mm. it is empirically um, simply not sustainable, as an mm. argument, in my view. But I, I, I mean, I, I'm sure that Richard Dawkins could out argue me on this subject any day <laughs> of the week, but I just I remain deeply skeptical mm. um, that he's that he's right. Hmm. Uh, in fact, I think there is every evidence that he isn't. And I also have to say that um, I don't find it terribly interesting as a line of argument, so I'd hmm. sort of rather <laughs> sort of leave it at... Hmm. Uh, yes. Well, that's the general consensus. <laughs> um, OK, well, let's go on to... Um, at the end of your time at Cambridge, unless there's anything... I mean, as an undergraduate at Newnham, um, is there anything you want to say about Newnham as a college uh, when you were here? Um. Well, I, I just uh, a few weeks ago um, did uh, an, an interview with uh, some graduate students at Newnham mm. uh, who are making a series. They're, they're trying to record uh, Newnham alumni from as far back as they, they, you know, the mm. oldest they can mm. find coming up through time, sort of talking mm. about what Newnham meant to them and what their mm. experiences were. Um, and how, how Newnham equipped them, uh, and I didn't, I didn't have a lot to say about to them about Newnham per se, uh, but it did. It, it's curious looking back on it because when I was at Cambridge as an undergraduate, there was one girl for every uh, seven or eight boys here, mm. but it didn't. I didn't experience it that way because I lived in an all women's college, so I had yeah. plenty of women friends. And it's sort of actually very interesting. Mm. It allowed, I suspect, that we led more normal lives than the men did, if you will, mm. because there were plenty of men for us to be friends with, mm. which was not true for them in the other direction. Mm. Uh, it's certainly within the university setting, but we also had this sort of this this rich array of, of wonderful and remarkable women living in Newnham, mm. and so it was a uh, it was both as a uh, as a sort of a maturational experience personally, and uh, in terms of sort of providing the basis for friendships of a lifetime, mm. uh, it did those things mm. for me. And, uh, and I did forge the friendships of a lifetime uh, at Newnham. Um, mm. Are there any friends who would like to particularly... No, 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 I'm not. There's so many. <laughs> no, 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 there aren't so many, but mm. there are some. Mm. And, uh, mm. and each of, uh, the 
you know, I told you about my first school and those reunions and my second yeah. school, Queenswood, and uh, reunions is too strong a word, just a coming together of, of people. I mean, there are, there are women now who I met and came to know at each of those three stages in my educational experience. Yeah. Who I who have you know with whom I have common threads still in my mm. life, mm. and I and remember when I see them why I like them and mm. that we still do. Mm. Um, it's quite interesting. Mm. It's quite interesting. Well, let, let's then move on because you did you think you might stay here to do a PhD because you went to London, didn't you? Um, yes. No, I, I wasn't going to stay here and do a PhD. I'm not sure why, mm. but. Uh, I don't know. The students that I have taught and mm. trained, I think I've given. I think that they have been given a far more sort of rational and systematic framework for thinking about what they do. Career counselling, mm. sort of advising students about how they imagine their trajectories, I think is a relatively recent thing. Or maybe I just was kind of sort of dense or mm. whatever because I just I keep you know again it was another of those sort of transitional points in my life why did I decide I, I know that I thought that maybe based on what Alison Charlie told me about Madagascar that that would be very interesting but then I somehow got it into my head that what I wanted to do is functional morphology and John Napier was mm. one of my heroes I didn't mm. know him I hadn't mm. met him but I'd read his work so I decided that I wanted to study with John Napier for my PhD. But how I really imagined that, with no training in anatomy to speak mm. of, mm. I mean, it just sort of looks to me completely ludicrous. Anyway, I went off and met John Napier in London, and he said he'd take me on as a student. And I was, you know, I gave him a proposal to study the functional morph or comparative functional morphology of the jaw mechanics of leaf-eating lemurs in Madagascar and I applied for money from the Royal Society and uh, the Explorers Club of America and one or two other and got a NATO scholarship and went off to Madagascar and changed my mind on the plane about what I was going to study. <laughs> you know, it's just completely horrifying looking back on it and what I ended up doing mm. in Madagascar was uh, a, com a compare, and I'm very glad I ch changed what I was doing because I was utterly unqualified mm. to, to study the jaw mechanics, the chewing mechanics of, uh, of injury. Um, and I ended up doing this comparative study of this one species, Propithecus varoxi, which is the big white lemur mm. in Madagascar, in the living in the spiny, these wonderful, amazing spiny forests of southern Madagascar that Alice and Charlie had inspired me with the love of and in a much wetter, greener forest in the northwest of the country. And the question was, if, if environment determines social behavior, how do these two very different environments sh differently shape the behavior of a single species living across different environments? And that was the subject matter of my, uh, uh, of my PhD. Hmm. And it was fun and interesting and... Well, it was very interesting, but it's 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 problematic because, uh, of course, you find differences between the animals in these two forests, and then you make up a story as to why they're different. <laughs> what you've actually proved is uh, another matter, and in fact, that whole line of research has moved a very long way since then, not least because of the work of Tim Clough and Brock, hmm. who is, of course, now a Royal Society professor here at Cambridge. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and uh, was a year ahead of me uh, when I was an undergraduate, yes. We, we used to write to each other when uh, he was studying red colobus in mm. uh, Tanzania and I was doing my uh, Propithecus research in Madagascar. And mm. we, I have this, I've still kept the correspondence, these mm. very serious, intense letters about mm. sort of the ranging behaviour of our animals. Well, Tim went on much more than I to really articulate a serious and intelligent way of thinking about these uh, kinds of issues. Hmm. But it was successful, you got your PhD and yes. um, John Napier continued as your supervisor even though you changed. Yes, subjects. yes, yes. And he, uh, when I went for my, P my PhD defence, hmm. he said, well, uh, I'll let John Cook ask the questions, dear, and I'll pour the sherry. <laughs> <laughs> 
So those uh, were the unreformed days when your supervisor was one of the examiners, is it? Um, yes. Still, I, I suffered. I mean, I. There were, there, were, I, there were three examiners, oh. and I can't remember who the third is, but John mm. was one, John mm. Crook from Bristol was the other, mm. and I'm not sure who the third was, mm. but um, <laughs> I've not forgotten the comment. <laughs> uh, Very nice. Um, what did you do when you, when you finished that? So then, what I was going to do uh, was go off to Alaska and study the uh, behaviour of musk oxen. Uh, with uh, a man by the name of Paul Wilkinson, who had been a graduate student of Eric Higgs, and who I had met uh, when I went digging in northwest Greece before I came up as an undergraduate. And we'd stayed friends. And he was undertaking a very interesting project with, uh, the, I think, the support of the Kellogg Foundation. Um, he, was, as an, he was an archaeologist, is an archaeologist, is still an archaeologist and has an interest in the domestication of, uh, of wild animals, of wildlife, and was working on a project to domesticate musk oxen and, and to harvest their wool, not by shearing them, mm. but by pulling it out of them. And the idea was that this wool is of extremely high quality and that it could be done in a kind of artisanal cottage industry way by Eskimos living up uh, in the Alaskan, uh, you know, above the snow line in Alaska as an alternative to working for oil companies, sort of to provide mm. some sort of high return, uh, sort, of, sort of socio-economic, socio-culturally appropriate alternative, mm, sort of subsistence, not subsistence, but alternative activity. To, to oil, and they were interested in having somebody do sort of have more understanding of the social dynamics of these animals. So I was actually quite interested in doing that. I thought it sounded different and also of value in doing something good for people as well as of interest from the research point of view, because I was really interested in musk ox and behavior. They're very interesting animals, they're still interesting. But in the middle of all of that, sort of starting to happen, I got a phone call from David Pilbeam out of the blue, who by now had moved uh, from Cambridge to Yale, where he was professor of anthropology. And he phoned up and said, uh, you must be finishing your PhD, and we have an opening for an assistant professor in physical anthropology, and would you be interested in applying? And uh, I you know, was completely flummoxed and said, Where's Yale? I mean, I didn't know. <laughs> and I flew over and gave a uh, job talk in the spring of 1972 and got off at the job. And uh, again, you know, without sort of thinking about this in any serious way, said, oh, great. So off I went to the United States, to Connecticut in the autumn of 1972, never imagining that it was going to be the next 30 years of my life. You know, mm. I mean, what did I imagine? I don't think I imagined anything very much, <laughs> which is probably just as well, because I think there's a lot in my life I wouldn't have done mm. if I'd thought about it very much. And since I haven't regretted what I've done with my life, I think sort of a lack of imagination may be quite a good thing. Reminds me, I mean, at some point you obviously got married. And is Richard your married name or your maiden name? Uh, my, my husband's name is Dewar. Ah, uh, that's right. He, it's the side of the Dewar family that uh, didn't fight on the side of the Campbells ah. and as a consequence got thrown off the highlands. Mm. And the, 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 the piece of the Dewar clan mm. that fought with the Campbells is now Dewar's Scotch. Yes. My husband's family unfortunately sort of fought with the loyalists, the Scottish mm. loyalists as it were, and ended up being kicked off the highlands and going off to Canada and then drifted down into northern Michigan. Hmm. And my husband grew up in Michigan and was a graduate student at Yale in archaeology. And in fact, his supervisor, uh, Chung Hong Chi, uh, was the chairman of the department at the time I was recruited. And he always took credit for us being married because he had recruited me to be married to his <laughs> graduate student. So. Uh, it wasn't um, quite as simple as that because Bob was married at the time, mm, mm, um, mm. but he went off to Taiwan 
and uh, did his PhD work. And uh, he and his, I mean, he and his wife, you know, they decided to go. Mm. They then uh, went their separate ways at that point. And Bob came back single. Mm. And I had remembered thinking that I would rather fancied mm. this man mm. if he hadn't been married. Well, you know, miraculously, <laughs> now he wasn't. So that was 1974. Well, uh, my question was actually just at the right moment then. Yes, yes. <laughs> By chance. Um, and he's re remained an academic or um, Bob? Well, he, he uh, yes, I mean, he, he was doing his PhD. I was at Yale. Then he went on to the job market. And it was before the job market in the States had closed down. So he was offered jobs at UC Santa Barbara, the University of Hawaii, uh, and then most closest to Yale, SUNY Potsdam. Well, that's on the St. Lawrence flood plain, and it's kind of a post-nuclear holocaust landscape, and we were convincing each other that commuting across the Adirondacks to see each other would be just fine, a six or seven hour drive. And then at the 11th hour, miraculously, he got a job at the University of Connecticut, which mm. is... Uh, and so we then got married, bought a house, and uh, at the midpoint of the shortest route between Yale and the University of Connecticut. So we each commuted 40 minutes in different directions, and probably, I mean, the chances of being gainfully employed anthropologists mm. living within 40 minutes of home mm. uh, is, you know, and married is absolutely amazing. But he's an archaeologist and a human ecologist and did his PhD work on the uh, origins of agriculture in Taiwan. Uh, but as it turns out, the conditions for preservation of organic remains in Taiwan are not good. Mm. And so he found a lot of pottery, but he didn't find the kind of the, mm. the grains and the organic remains he would have wished for. So he was actually thinking of going uh, for after he finished, and he couldn't work in what we then called mainland China at that mm. time, that was completely off limits. So he was going to work in Indonesia perhaps, but I kept saying to him, well, you know, Madagascar is really yeah. interesting because the megafauna all mm. went extinct and people arrived late, they, the early, you know, they colonised the island in the last 2,000 years and what on earth were they doing that drove an entire megafauna to extinction within the 500 years of arriving there? So around 1975, Bob started working in Madagascar and still has major research projects going there, as well as in, I mean, he's not working in New England now, but he has been working in New England mm. and on various more theoretical issues. Mm. So he is here at Cambridge, a fellow of the Macdonald Institute oh, of Archaeology. Right. Yeah, yes, that was one thing. Well, he's not being consort to the Vice Chancellor, <laughs> so that's a piece of his uh, duties. Mm. Um, tell me a little more, well, there's so, so much to say about Yale, obviously. That isn't where you met a mutual friend, Keith Hart, is it? At oh, yes, Yale? yes, absolutely, yes. Because yes. He, he was there for a while. Tell me about Keith, just to, to get it off our shoulders, so to speak. He's remained well, a friend, Keith, hasn't he? Keith uh, arrived... Uh, Keith was an enormously important intellectual influence uh, on me and on Bob. Mm. Uh, because he had a deep belief in the intellectual coherence of anthropology, mm -hmm. which of course is rare in mm -hmm. these days. And he came to Yale uh, driving an agenda mm -hmm. of uh, intellectual engagement among the subfields of anthropology. And, uh, you know, and, and he, he would come up to our house 40 minutes outside New Haven um, and I have a feeling that being 40 minutes away from this kind of, uh, you know, this vortex of Keith's intellectual activity was part of why our friendship has always remained good. And he would come up to, to, to uh, Middle Haddam and we would, you know, argue late into the night and you know, Keith would be running flags up poles and many of the flags, you know, you'd say, oh, no, that's really, come on, Keith, you know, and the flag would be hauled down again and then up would go another flag. And, and, and there was brilliance amidst... Mm. The, this sort of cascade of ideas. Mm. We've remained good friends, mm. and uh, though we don't, we don't, see, we don't see him that often, but we don't see any of our friends <laughs> very often. Mm. Um, but but at, but in terms of giving me uh, still 
a sense that anthropology does have uh, as much sense as a discipline as many do, hmm. the epistemological, sort of methodological fault lines notwithstanding. Keith drove that into hmm. my brain uh, more than anybody else had done in a really, really uncompromising and, uh, uh, I think, you know, unforgettable and, and, and very cogent way. Mm -hmm.